Good morning, everybody. My name is Garrett McCord. I'm the youth pastor here. It is great to be with you. Uh, how's everybody doing? Everybody good? Everybody awake? Uh, I apologize if I look a little bit sleepy. Um, we actually just came back from getting to officiate my cousin's wedding in Dallas. And it would have been no big deal, but we drove back last night. And this wasn't in normal Dallas. This was in like the far northern hemisphere of Dallas. And the thing about Dallas, Dallas is an hour drive from Dallas. So it will take you a good hour just to get from one end to the other. Uh, but on the way up, we actually passed through the town of Allen. And Allen is, I mean, it's a concrete jungle, but it's actually a fairly pretty city. But as we're driving through, it dawned on me that just two weeks ago, nine people were killed in that city. And, and now let me pause that I, and say, I'm by no means trying to get into the politics of it all. I'm simply saying that two weeks ago, nine innocent lives were taken there, and that deserves mourning. And this family were actually among the victims. Uh, and three of the members of this family, the youngest son and then the two parents were actually killed, and the oldest boy was the only survivor. And I think the most unfortunate part of this entire tragedy is that it honestly seems like it's just another in a long line of tragedies to scroll across the news headlines in the past few weeks and months and even years. I mean, you look and you have this looming specter of the war in Europe, you have this banking crisis that may or may not happen, the debt ceiling crisis, the societal debate on abortion and transgenderism, and we've seen that show up here in Bernie lately, have we not? And we see all these things and it can be so easy to be fearful of the world that we're sending our seniors into, right? This is senior recognition. And it can be so easy to become jaded or to become worried or to just live in this constant state of anxiety. And we typically really have two responses when we see all of this brokenness, when it's put in front of us. And the first is we look around and we just feel like there's no hope. We get apathetic, we detach, we just, I'm not even gonna try to engage, I'm gonna stay in my little bubble and do my little thing and we'll, the world's gonna be the world. Or two, we look around and we get angry. We jump headfirst into the culture war. We turn it into an us versus them. We see if we can shout louder than their side does. And the problem with that is that neither one of those approaches actually solve the problem. Ignoring it doesn't make it go away. And complaining about it and yelling at it typically actually just makes it worse. And so this morning, I'd like to propose a third option and because we're gonna look at a story in God's word that takes place in a very similar cultural moment to the one that we live in right now. And in doing that, we're gonna see a lot of wisdom about how we should conduct ourselves as believers in this day and age. And so if you have your Bible with you, please flip open to 1 Kings chapter 19. If you don't have a Bible with you, there should be one in the pew rack in front of you. That is our gift to you. Take it, mark it up. We want you to have a copy of God's word. And so this passage comes on the heels of one of the most well-known accounts in scripture. This just awesome showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And it's actually one of my favorite stories in scripture because at the time the evil King Ahab was on the throne and his wife was uh, Queen Jezebel who was just about as evil if not worse than he was. And Ahab married Jezebel and she immediately began to institute Baal worship in Israel. In fact, one of the first things that she did upon marrying Ahab was kill as many of the prophets of the Lord as possible, try to wipe them all out. And now Elijah was the prophet in the land at the time. He was God's messenger. And Je Jezebel and Ahab had chased him all over the place trying to kill him. And then in 1 Kings 18, you have this like Wild West showdown between Elijah and Ahab because Elijah goes up to one of Ahab's servants and he says, hey, you tell Ahab I'm here. You tell him to show up. And so Ahab goes and he says, man, is that you, Elijah, troubler of Israel? And I picture kind of like a Wild West movie scene, like the da -na -na -na, like six shooters, like ready to go, like midtown, high noon in front of a saloon or something. And you get this big showdown and Elijah tells Ahab, hey, go round up all the prophets of Baal and meet me at Mount Carmel. And we're gonna settle this thing once and for all. And so they do. And when they get there, Elijah issues this challenge. He says, you get a bull, I get a bull. We're gonna make two separate altars. You're gonna cut up that bull, you're gonna put it on the altar, and we're gonna to pray to our respective gods, and whichever God sends down fire to burn up that altar, he's the real God. And so Elijah lets them go first, and so they go around, and they dance, and they yell, and they shout, and they actually even start to get so desperate, because obviously nothing is happening, that they start to gnash themselves. 
and then you see this, it's about three in the afternoon and Elijah's just taunting them. And this is like real middle school stuff, right? He's like, yeah, well, maybe Baal's asleep. Like maybe he's relieving himself. He's in the restroom. He just needs a break. Maybe he's on vacation. And then Elijah prepares the altar. And as soon as Elijah prepares the altar, he actually pours water on it to drive this point home. And he calls upon God and God immediately sends down fire and burns up the altar. It's immediate, as soon as that, to show the power of God. God is the true God. And then Elijah rounds up all the prophets of Baal and he, he executes them, he kills them in a sign of judgment. And so that's where we pick up in 1 Kings 19. So let's read in verse one. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. And then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah and left his servant there. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray that you would open our ears and our hearts and our minds to your truth. Would you help us to, God, just, just pay attention to what you might be trying to show us through your text, God. Would you help us to be obedient to whatever you might be calling us to do, Lord. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so this whole thing happens at Mount Carmel and word gets back to Jezebel and she's understandably not very happy, right? And her response is a little bit wordy in that translation, but she basically says, hey, may God kill me if I don't kill you. Which if you're Elijah, that's not really ideal, right? Like the queen is trying to hunt you down and has put an ultimatum on her life to take your life. And so he's, just, he's scared, he flees for his life. He runs into the wilderness, he leaves a servant, and this is this big twist. Because if you're following the story along, you probably expected this to be the climax and this big turning point. Because you just have Elijah boldly, he confronts Ahab and now he's running away scared. And not only is he scared, but he's dejected. We'll read here in a few more verses that he's doubting his mission and his calling, and it's just, he's in this really bad headspace. And if you're like me, you read this and you can't help but wonder, why does he respond so extravagantly? Why is he so despondent? Why is he so dejected? I mean, he just got to be a part of like this massive triumphant victory over these prophets. One of the like top five miracles in all of scripture, he got to witness this. And not only that, but it's not like Jezebel and Ahab haven't been trying to kill him this entire time. It's not like he did that and now all of a sudden they're hunting him. They've been hunting him before all the Mount Carmel stuff went down. And so why did this impact him so greatly? Why did he have this breakdown just out of the blue? Well, I would like to suggest it's because his expectations fell short. He was expecting the test on Mount Carmel to be this finishing blow. He was expecting it to be the end. He thought he'd finally won, that Ahab and Jezebel were gonna repent, they were gonna turn, his opposition was gonna go away and life was gonna just be a breeze from here on out. He didn't think that Jezebel was gonna double down and try to come after him and kill him even more. And so when his expectations weren't met, he started to doubt God. And let's be real here this morning, church, don't we do the same thing? lest we just point at Elijah, don't we do that same thing in our lives so often? We have all sorts of expectations. We have expectations for our money, for our relationships, for our marriage, for our kids, for our kids' relationships, for our career. Seniors, you have a lot of expectations around what college might look like, around what groups that you're gonna get into. And there's a saying that I find so true and that I've seen in my life time and time again, and it's this, that expectations are the highest platform from which we fall. Because we so often hold so tightly to our expectations that we create in our own head that we start to convince ourselves that they're a part of God's plan. And so if things don't go the way we think they're going to go, we start to feel like, well, God didn't hold up his end of the deal. He shorted me, he let me down. All the while, he never promised us those things in the first place. And, and I think the first time I saw this really, really tangibly in my life, or, or, or noticed it at least, was senior year of my college experience. I was, I was a senior in 2020. I went to Dallas Baptist University, go Pats, um, and real small Baptist school. None of y'all probably know where they're at. But I was really involved on campus, and, and God had done some amazing things in my life there. And so I really had a lot of expectations for what senior year was going to look like. 
I was excited to go alumni in the fraternity that I was in. God had used those men to hone me into the person I am today, and I was excited to celebrate that with them. I was excited to get to do the graduation parties and spend time with all of my friends and celebrate these last three years. And then to get to celebrate the engagement, and Christine and I were getting engaged that semester, and there were just all these exciting things that were coming up, and then COVID. And spring break rolled around, and we never came back. Uh, but Christine and I actually did come back. We worked on campus at the time, and I worked for maintenance, and so we were essential, because as long as students throw random stuff down garbage disposals, I had job security, so it was wonderful. <laughs> Kept me from going crazy during the pandemic. <laughs> But I realized that whole time I was there, and I know everybody kind of went through this, but I was just in this weird funk. I mean, I had a work, like I had work, I had a job, I wasn't just sitting around doing nothing, but I just couldn't shake this, this weird kind of sense of disappointment. And I didn't realize until afterwards that I was mourning the death of my expectations. Because I had created all of this stuff in my head that I convinced myself was God rewarding me for all this hard work I did when I was at college. And it was just man-made. It was just in my head. It was what I wanted. It was my pride. And when those fell through, I, I began to doubt God. And he had to humble me of that. And he had to pull me back and show me his plan for me. He had to remove from me that sense of entitlement that started to well up as I thought he owed me something, right? And so the answer to, to not falling from our expectations is not to just have no expectations at all. That would be boring. That would be sad. I'm not saying to walk around life not expecting anything, this kind of nihilistic whatever. We simply have to have true expectations. We have to have re expectations that align themselves with reality. But, but let me ask you, how do we know our expectations are true? Aren't expectations about something in the future? How can I know what's coming ahead? How can I have realistic expectations the only way you can know if your expectations are true is the degree that they're based upon the scriptures. The only way you can know if you have true expectations is if they're based on God's truth and his word. And so let's tie this back into the text and apply it to our lives. Elijah's false expectation that he fell from is that he thought the opposition he was facing would go away. He thought he would finally get a break, people would like him, and oftentimes, we as believers do the exact same thing. We, as Christians, we expect, hey, if I'm faithful enough to God, then everything's going to be a breeze. <laughs> yeah, and some of you chuckle because we all know that's a terrible expectation, right? You look at the life of Paul and John and Timothy and the apostles, and we know that oftentimes being a believer is actually more difficult because now in this world, we're aliens, we're foreigners, we're strangers. Jesus himself said it to his disciples before he left in John 15. He says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And see, the world that Elijah lived in and the world that we live in today are opposed to God, are opposed to the things of God. And I could go on a long tangent about this, but basically two things that always show up is there's a rebellion against God and his word, and there's a redefinition of good and evil. And not only that, but when you don't go along with those two things, you're seen as cruel, hateful, or even oppressive. And so when we understand that, then we can start to set some realistic expectations if you're gonna follow Jesus in this world. And listen closely, especially you seniors, really everybody across the board, if you are following Jesus, you will never fit in with the culture. You're never going to be a part of the cool in crowd. You're never going to be admired by the culture overall. You're never gonna probably be a celebrity in the sense, but that's okay. Because there's so much more to that when it comes to following Jesus. And even when you face opposition, when you're a believer, God will provide for you. God knows your needs. God sees your suffering. God sees what you're going through. And he is there with you in the middle of that. And that's exactly what we see in the next few verses in this passage. And so if you'll start back up, we're going to be back in verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, this is Elijah, saying, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. 
And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. And so we pick back up. Elijah's fled into the wilderness. He goes under this tree and he says, enough, God, just take my life. I can't do it anymore. He is at the bottom, rock bottom, really bad head space. And he takes a nap and the angel wakes him up and gives him some bread and some water, which to me is really, really funny because like Elijah's having this existential crisis and God's like, dude, like you're hangry and tired. Take a nap, eat some food, wake up in an hour, you'll be fine which I joke about, but in this moment, you really do get, a, get this wonderful picture of the tenderness of God, right? Because God's God. He could have told him, dude, pick yourself up, get your stuff together, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. You haven't been killed yet, have you? Good, now go and deal with what I'm telling you to deal with. But he didn't. He saw Elijah's suffering, and whether Elijah was being dramatic or not, he comforted him. He met him in the middle of it. Before God told him to do anything, he provided his needs, his felt needs. And that's just this beautiful picture of how God provides for his people in the middle of our words, in the middle of our moments. And then even later when God tells him to go to Mount Horeb, which is actually Mount Sinai, and just so you know, a little side note, that's 260 miles away. That's why it takes 40 days and 40 nights. Even then God tells him, hey, eat up. This is gonna be a really long journey and you're gonna need the strength to be able to make it. And the thing is, God didn't just provide and take care of Elijah that way because he was some biblical hero. God is just as kind and tender and loving towards us. In the middle of our hurt, in the middle of our disappointment, in the middle of our unmet expectations. And now it might not be some snacks and a nap. I I really wish that was God's provision sometime. Like, can you imagine that, moms? Like an angel shows up and is like, hey, I'm gonna take the kids to the park. Uh, I'll be there three hours. I door dashed you some Chick-fil-A because it's God's chicken. Uh, And you just take a nap. You enjoy, I got this. I'll be back in a little bit. But while it might not be that, look at scripture. Look at Philippians 4, 6 through 7. It promises that if you would present your request to God, that a peace which goes beyond all understanding, meaning you might not know the answers, you might not know the end of that situation, but you'll get a peace that transcends all of that. And then in Matthew 6, Jesus says, hey, if I'm gonna take care of the grass and the birds, I'm gonna take care of you too. And then later he says in verse 31, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. But let's again be real. I don't wanna just deal in spiritual platitudes. Let's be real this morning. A lot of you have heard that verse. And a lot of you walked in here this morning disappointed, upset, hurt, broken. And that just rings on deaf ears. Anyway, I don't feel like God's providing for me in this moment. And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we don't actually see God's provision until we look back and see that his hand was on us and in our lives the entire way. Let me go back to that original illustration of my time at college. Um, I was real bummed out and eventually God brought me out of it, but now I look back and I see so tangibly, probably more than any other time in my life, God's hand on my life in that moment. Because in that lockdown, I, I formed a relationship with a guy named Dr. Gary Cook, not our Dr. Gary Cook, Dallas Dr. Gary Cook, the chancellor of DBU. And one day I met him in the gym because he was like super fit for somebody in his 70s. Like he was working out. Like you could always tell he would drag one of his like uh, admin guys along who's like this young 20 year old. And that kid was trying to struggle to keep up with him. Like he's making him do another pull up. And this is a chancellor. So you're like, I better, like I'm not gonna fail him. And, and he would love to do all that. So I met him there at the gym and we had a conversation or whatever. And we went our separate ways and I didn't hear from him. And then in the middle of COVID, I guess because everything was shut down and he had nothing to do. He recalled that conversation and he shot me an email. He's like, hey, Garrett, I never got to give you that book that I wanted to give you because he had offered to, to give me one when we met. Uh, do you mind like coming into my office and uh, you know, seeing me? And I'm like, oh goodness, like, uh, sure. Like, this is the chancellor of DBU. This is the middle of a work day. So I'm in like a polo and jeans. I've got like, like nasty shower drain hair all over me. It was gross. And I'm like, I'm about to walk into the nicest building on campus and meet the former president of the university. I have no idea why he wants to meet with me, right? Like, I feel like I'm about to get kicked out of school or something. But I go in and I sit down and he just asks me about my life. Asks me about my day. How are you doing? What's God doing in your life? What's going on? 
And I tell him, well, you know, I'm engaged to Christine and we're trying to graduate and I'm trying to pay off the rest of my balance and we're trying to find a job. Uh, and he stops and he says, well, I feel like God told me to help you. And this happens from time to time with students on campus. I just feel like God told me to help you. So don't worry about your balance, that'll be gone. Paid off, don't worry about it. I just need you to write a thank you note. Uh, and you can use me as a reference in, in, your, in your job search. And I'm sitting there just like jaw on the floor, right? Like I have no idea what just happened. I'm like, you're, this isn't a trap. Like you're not trying to get me, like finance isn't about to kick down the door and like drag me out. Like, he's like, no, I just, I just feel like God called me to help you. And it was in that moment when I look back, none of that would have happened had my expectations worked. Had my expectations worked, sure, I'd have gotten to go to some parties, I'd have gotten to celebrate things, but God had other plans. Through Dr. Cook, he was able to help me get graduated. He gave me the reference. He got me plugged in here. Had the shutdown never happened, I would have never heard about Bernie. Not a chance. I would have stayed in Dallas. And so I look back and something that was once the source of disappointment I look back and I was like, man, God was in that. What does that matter now? Well, when I look back now, I'm like, man, if God got me through that, then whatever I'm going through now, why, why am I worried? What am I worried about? So when you feel like God's not there in the middle of your struggle, in the middle of whatever is going on right now, I don't know, family, work, etc. Look back at all the times when you knew God was there, when you felt his presence tangibly. Let me speak again to you seniors. There will be times in your next step where things get hard. God feels distant. And when, time, when those times come, think back to today. Think back to, to later when you walk, right? In a few days, when you walk that stage, think about all the things that God did to bring you here. Bring you to this moment and know that he'll do it again. He'll be faithful. For the rest of us in the room, think about the hardest times in our life, the lowest of lows, and now reflect, what did God teach you in that moment? We might not want that moment back, but a lot of times we wouldn't trade the lessons God taught us through it for anything. I know I wouldn't. And so even when we don't feel God, even when we don't feel his presence, know that he is there providing. We can look back on his faithfulness and that can give us hope and strength in the middle of whatever we face right now. But there are times, and we see this next in the story, where God very clearly shows up in the moment and everything changes. Because God does show up to Elijah and everything has changed, but it doesn't look exactly like you might think it does. So let's pick up in verse nine. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even only I am left and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore the mountain and broke it into pieces, the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And even I, only I am left and they seek my life to take it away. And then the Lord said to him, go, Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Maloah, you shall announce to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. So I know that was a lot of text, but let me catch you up. Elijah makes this trek to Mount Sinai and, and he settles down in a cave. And some people actually say that this is the very cave that God met Moses in. And God's word comes to Elijah and he asks, hey, Elijah, what are you doing here? Now God knows what Elijah is doing there, right? God told him to go to that mountain. And so what God's doing, he's asking a question of intent. He's getting Elijah to think through, why are you here? What are you struggling with? What are you doing right now? And Elijah shows his doubt. He responds, he says, hey, I've been trying to serve you, God, but everybody else has bailed. 
I'm the only one, and you know what my reward is? They're trying to kill me, and they've killed everybody else. And then things get crazy. Scripture says that the presence of God shows up in a super powerful way. There's this earthquake and fire, and God showed Elijah his power, but it says that God's voice was in none of them. And then it says God's voice finally comes in this small whisper, and he asks him the same question. Elijah, what are you doing here? And you'd think that Elijah would have responded differently, right? Because he just saw this earthquake and this fire and all those things, but he doesn't. He responds the exact same way. Nothing has changed. He's still despondent. He's still broken. And then you finally get the thing that snaps him out of it. God gives him a new mission. He tells him, hey, you're going to go anoint this king. You're going to go pick Elisha for your successor. And they're going to rain down judgment on these wicked people. And this is such a profound picture of how God sometimes comforts us. Because a lot of times in our Western American kind of thinking, we like to think of comfort as like a pat on the back, a nice little hug. And sometimes God does provide for us in that way. But here, God's provision for Elijah is a new mission, a new charge, a new purpose. Because God gave him all the other stuff. He gave him a food, he gave him water, and it didn't do anything. But he snapped out of it when he finally got to see, hey, I'm a part of something bigger than myself. And that changed everything. And God offers comforts us in the same way. He gives us a new mission. But our mission's obviously not the same as Elijah's, right? Elijah was going to anoint a king and a prophet and rain down judgment. And as fun as that sounds, that doesn't happen a whole lot anymore, right? If it does, please let me know. So what is our mission? Well, to really understand it, you have to hone on that last verse where God says, I preserve 7,000 people in Israel. Whether that's a literal number or symbolic, doesn't really matter. Big point is God has preserved others. He says, you're not alone. You're part of the remnant. And that word remnant is this thread that's woven all throughout scripture of God's preservation of faithful people. Time and time again, throughout judgment, throughout catastrophe, calamity, God always preserves a remnant. You see it with Noah and his family after the flood. They're the faithful remnant. You see it with Lot and his family after Sodom and Gomorrah. You see it here in this story. And then after the exile in Jerusalem falls, you see a remnant preserved in Babylon and Assyria. And you see that God always keeps his people and preserves them. But now in the new covenant, right, on the other side of Jesus, the remnant is the church. We are the remnant. We are the ones that God has preserved in a broken world. And the mission he gives us is not of judgment, but we get to be the ones who bring his plan of restoration and healing to a lost and dying world through the hope of the gospel. That's our mission. That's our charge. And I promise you, that will refresh you. When you get a glimpse of that, when you get to see that, when you get to be a part of that, that will get you out of bed in the morning. If you feel no hope, If you feel angry at the world, when you get a glimpse, when you see, when you get to be a part of a gospel conversation with someone, I know for me, getting to be a part of VBS, when you see the light bulb click on in a kid's head and their whole existence changes, it's something powerful. And here's where it gets really practical because I know we've talked about this earlier this morning, that it gets very easy to look around at the world we live in and get really cynical by all the secularism, that the world seems like it's going further away from God. And if you're not careful, it looks like secularism is winning. And just like Elijah, we can sit here in our church, in our home and feel like, God, there's nobody left. I turn on the news, I turn on the TV, I go to work, I go wherever, and it feels like I'm the only one. There's nobody left. It's just me. God, will you help me? And you don't need me up here adding fire to the cultural wars. You don't need me up here to just give you some you know, good raw raws, and this is why the other guys are wrong. Because we already talked about that doesn't help anything. But that brings me to one of what I really think could be the thesis for this entire sermon and one of the most impactful quotes I've ever heard when it comes to thinking about this topic. And it's from a guy named Carl Truman. And Carl Truman writes that the task of the Christian is not to whine about the moment in which he or she lives, but to understand its problems and respond appropriately to them. The task of the Christian is not to whine about the moment in which he or she lives, but to understand its problems and respond appropriately to them. First of all, ouch. But secondly, what that's saying is when we look at the world, seniors, when you look at the world that you're going to, parents, when you look at the world that you're raising your kids out to be, we don't need to be bummed out. We don't need to be afraid of the environment we're going into. We should see it as our mission. As the remnant, we're the ones who get to bring healing. Guys, you understand we're God's plan for this generation. We're God's plan for this world. 
Like C.S. Lewis ain't coming back. G.K. Chesterton, he ain't coming back. We're it. And God's not scratching his head wondering what's going to happen. That's our mission. We get to be a part of God bringing healing to this world. Like we get to do that. And when you know that, you can understand realistic expectations, right? You're going to face op uh, opposition, but I know that God will be with me no matter what it looks like, no matter where he takes me. And so I really got a glimpse of this um, a couple of weeks ago, and it was at this, con uh, this conference that I went to. Uh, it was a preaching conference, and John Tyson was one of the speakers, and he closed with this really, really powerful illustration. Uh, and so there's this picture. This is the Atacama Desert. This is one of the driest, deadest places on earth. It gets less than 12 millimeters of rain per year. And I mean, this is where they take like Mars rovers to go and test them. Like there's nothing out here. On the surface, it looks completely dead. It looks completely devoid of life. But just beneath the surface are thousands of wildflowers that lay dormant. And when that desert gets just enough rain, this is what it turns into. And scientists call it a super bloom. And it's one of the most beautiful things that you'll witness in nature. And I showed you that because I believe, church, that God has put us here for a reason. When I look at the world, when I look at Bernie, when I look at Austin College Station, through the eyes of the flesh, I'm hopeless. But when I look at it through the eyes of God, I'm filled with faith because I know that underneath the surface are thousands of lives just waiting to give their life to Jesus. And God's just waiting for you and I. He's waiting for people who wanna see it, who wanna chase after those people, who wanna engage, who wanna bring the hope and healing towards that world. God has put you here for a reason. You might look at your workplace full of workaholics and ladder climbers. You might look at your family where you're the only one who believes. You might look at your school full of kids chasing popularity and a nicotine high. You might look at your college town where alcoholism is the norm. It doesn't matter where you are. Understand that God has given you as a mission and his mission might be his provision. It might be the thing that he needs you to take a hold of so you would see, hey, you're a part of something bigger than yourself. I know that you're hurting. I know that you're going through something right now, but I have something so much better. You get to take a part in what I'm doing in this world. And so would you call on him? Would you be obedient when he responds to you? Because I believe God has put you here for a purpose and there's a super bloom on the way. Secularism is not this generation's threat, this is what Tyson says, but it's this generation's opportunity. Because secularism, the transgender movement, all the things that seem like they're coming up against Christianity, they will fail. But guess what, when it does, we'll be here, just like we've always been, with the hope of the gospel, waiting for those flowers to bloom. That will give you the strength to get up in the morning. That will get you out of bed. So as we move to a time of response, I want to ask you before anything, to be a part of that mission, you've got to be a part of God's kingdom. And so maybe you hear that, maybe like, man, that sounds amazing. Like, I need that. I need that calling. I need that purpose in my life. It begins at the feet of Jesus. So if you have not placed your faith in him, if you have not given him your life, if you've not followed him, that's first. That's step number one. And I promise it changes everything because he'll be with you. And then two, maybe here this morning and, and you know that I've been so caught up in just the, the negativity of it all. I've been in this kind of echo chamber and I've just been really beating myself up and I, I've just really been sucked into all of it. What would it look like this morning for you to step back and ask God, hey God, where do you have for me to go on mission? Where, where do you want me to serve? And I'm not saying necessarily a mission trip, but in your workplace, in your home, in your family, how can you be a part of God's plan to bring healing to a world that desperately needs it? And so I'm gonna pray and I'm just gonna ask that you would be open to the Lord leading you however he might be. Maybe, maybe you need to come down and pray Maybe you just need to sit there and worship in a seat. Maybe you need to, we have those response cards in the pew backs. Maybe you need to just write down, where is God calling you to? What opportunities has he given you to be a messenger of the good news? Right next door or thousands of miles away, what might it look like? 
And so I'm gonna pray and then I just wanna give you that space to respond and be obedient to the Lord, whatever he's calling you to do. Lord God, we thank you so much for your word this morning. We praise you and we worship you, God, because you are, you are just so good and kind and loving and we can't even wrap our heads around it, God. And I pray this morning that you would help us to just have a vision of the beautiful thing that you've called us to, Lord. Help us to catch a glimpse of it. Through all the negativity, through all the cynicism, God, would you help us to just see, Lord, that you are on the throne, you are in control, and you, God, are king, you have won the victory, and we get to be a part in ushering that in, Lord. Would you help us to just see that, to be encouraged by that, to be refreshed by that, Lord. For those who we're sending out today, Lord, would you help them to catch a glimpse of that, to not be worried or anxious, but to have a bold confidence that comes from knowing that you are their father and you are in control and you are with them as they go. Lord, we love you. We praise you and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and respond?